I'm Morgan Pekma, Editor-in-Chief of City and State, and this is Last Look. Today we're on location at the American Institute of Architects New York chapter uh, on uh, LaGuardia Place in Manhattan, and we're joined by the Executive Director of AIA, Rick Bell, and the President, Jill Lerner. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. So you have just issued a, a 30-point platform for the future of the city. Um, can you talk about uh, what, why you have decided to kind of expand beyond your traditional role of advising uh, the mayors and the city council and, and gone into this realm of public policy? Well, when we started the year, we knew this was going to be a very important transition year for New York in terms of educating New Yorkers and educating the candidates on what we felt have been the great successes of the last 12 years and what are the remaining challenges that we really should be addressed in the next administration and which were the really successful policies that should be continued. And so we wanted to go on record and really put forth our ideas about what some of those issues affecting the built environment are. They affect New Yorkers every day, they affect tourism, they affect travel, they affect business. Um, efficiency, effectiveness, jobs, so many issues are touched by the construction in the built environment and design. So Mayor Bloomberg has obviously presided over an extraordinary growth and building in the city. Uh, how would you evaluate his, his, tw uh, his three terms in office? On balance, there have been many, many successes, not just the creation of 800 acres of parks and creating access to the waterfront. Those are very visible, but it's also the very structure of the city, how we think about the possibilities of creating affordable housing, um, how we talk about how people get around the city, the uh, uh, creation of uh, new means of transit, the bike lanes, the bike share, have been improvements that we think are going to remain and have transformed how we live in New York. And that's what we catalog in the document that you've been referring to, the victories of the last 12 years, and also how they could be augmented, improved, and in some cases tweaked a little bit. Are these changes kind of baked into the cake now, or is it possible for a mayor to, the next mayor to, to take us really uh, in the wrong direction? Well, that's a great question. I think New Yorkers in general recognize that New York is a better place in terms of its built environment. I think they appreciate all the parks and the park development and uh, all the other improvements that, that Rick mentioned. I think there uh, is a general recognition that the quality of design has made, made this a better place. I think the Barclays Stadium, for instance, has been a huge help. I think there's tremendous excitement about Hudson Yards finally being underway. There's in in anticipation that in the, the next 10 years we could consider a better place for, for, um, Penn, for Penn Station and uh, get the Moynihan Station really going. So I think there's a lot of uh, great things that have happened and I think New Yorkers generally recognize and appreciate those improvements. So my hope would be that any next administration would be able to continue to move the ball forward and that would be a widely uh, well-received policy. I would agree with that and say that every new mayor, any new mayor is going to put um, their own stamp on priorities uh, uh, coming mm -hmm. from their perspective, their constituency, how they got elected. Um, the things that are bricks and mortar and are built, whether it's a particular building or a particular park installation, are irreversible, and, and that's a good thing. Things that have been piloted uh, uh, mm -hmm. need to be made permanent if they work, uh, whether that is um, uh, policy, uh, ADAPT, micro units, or, a, uh, or an idea that has had a sort of a demonstration fiscal uh, elaboration. I think the thing that's most important is to look at some of the policies, energy policy, waterfront policy, and talk about how things that are conceptual continue and how resources are allocated to make sure that they're real when they take multiple administrations to effectuate, particularly post-Sandy. But isn't there also a, you know, a fundamental philosophical approach to development that heavily influences the way that our city takes shape I mean sure, you mentioned I mean, you mentioned the Barclays Center right I mean that was very contentious battle over Atlantic Yards and certainly the mayor could have decided to side with preserving the communities in, in place maybe landmarked areas you know and instead of terraforming that area and that you know would have substantively changed our city right well I think that's a case uh, that you're exactly right and I think uh, what gets developed, where it gets developed can certainly be hugely impacted by the mayor's priorities. But I think there's so much to do that uh, you know whether we invest in infrastructure, hopefully we can do it all, infrastructure or continued or, or, or affordable housing that's really well designed. I think what I would add is that we're all New Yorkers <laughs> and whatever political affiliation, uh, whatever ideological starting point, the idea that New York is a globally competitive city, what uh, right. Jill and others at the center have been pushing this year, uh, uh, is very, very important. And that doesn't come from being static. It doesn't come from retrenching. 
Uh, we have great historic districts, over 100 in number, but we at the center have talked and exhibited ways of building in historic districts uh, that are uh, contextually appropriate but allow for growth. So the idea of growth, whether it is in one campaign or the other, the idea of development is not uh, uh, growth, no growth. The city is expanding. It's expanding uh, its population. It's expanding its global influence. Uh, I think whoever is elected uh, as mayor, whoever is elected in the other citywide and local council offices is cognizant of the need for change and growth, uh, especially if it benefits all people in the city. And that's to, where the discussion is most interesting. Yeah. So to add to that, I would just say in terms of public-private partnerships, there's been a lot of um, success on that front in terms of pr public money being dedicated for specific uses and then private investment following on. And together, it's the public money and the private investment that really help build our neighborhoods here in New York. And I think any future administration hopefully will be able to continue that partnership. It's not one or the other. It really takes both entities working together. In your platform, how many of the recommendations are predicated upon uh, improving the aesthetics of the city versus kind of the practical uh, infrastructure, the nuts and bolts of, of how the city is built? There's actually uh, very little about aesthetics. People think of architects often as being concerned with how something looks, its facade, but um, we're actually just as concerned with how something functions. Uh, energy, for instance, is not a function entirely of what the building is clad with. It's about the building systems and how it's used and how it's programmed. So part of our platform is about energy policy, the things that came from the uh, 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 city's task force and from the mayor's office of long-term planning and sustainability, the continuation and strengthening of that office and passing of some of the local laws that have been stalled uh, that talk about, for just one example, energy policy. A second one, if I might, is on the very nature of government, of how governmental reform might accelerate not just development projects that have been stalled during the recession, but how uh, uh, it uh, helps all citizens of New York, not just the architects and engineers who uh, get uh, shunted from agency to agency for approvals, how we make the process work better, how the structure of city government uh, uh, relates to the development process. That is not about aesthetics. That's about process. But I would say, not to diminish the importance of aesthetics, I think hiring great architects who come up with great innovative solutions and really add quality to the, to the built environment is absolutely essential. And I think uh, when you look at the High Line and the su success of the High Line, that's very much uh, part and parcel of its really fantastic design. Same with the Barclays Center. I think if it was an eyesore, the public reaction would have been very different. You know, the fact that it's well planned, that you can arrive in a, a fantastic way on mass transit, arrive at a great plaza, you know, to an inviting building that's really become an icon for Brooklyn. I think all of that contributes to the success of the, uh, it's, uh, of it's the center. I think, and I think design's really important. And even for affordable housing. We uh, yes. were fortunate to work with HBD on Via Verde in the South Bronx near the hub. Uh, 147th and Brook Avenue. That is a beautifully designed project developed by Jonathan Rose Companies and Phipps Houses, designed by Grimshaw and Datner. Um, the aesthetics of that project are very, very important, but so are its energy performance, so are the fact that their rooftop gardens follows the active design principles published by the city. It's the whole thing coming together, how it looks, how it functions, how it's financed, and how replicable a model it might be. Uh, Bill de Blasio said in last night's debate that he wanted uh, his kind of long-term uh, bold legacy to be shaped in part by building 200,000 new units of affordable housing. In your platform, you call for 100,000 new units. Are those intended to be uh, purely affordable units? And what do you think is the feasibility of achieving 200,000 new units of affordable housing? Well, that's also a great question. Um, we were. Uh I hate to use the word conservative, but we were being conservative in suggesting that 100,000 units of new housing uh, uh, were realizable. The Bloomberg administration plan for 160,000 units of affordable housing um, uh, has been largely achieved, but it talked also about keeping existing affordable housing off of the market, renovating housing and not just building new. What we focused in more than the income issues of qualification was on new construction, uh, both to create construction jobs, certainly design jobs, but it's really more about filling the social need of allowing people who are graduating from college or graduate school, finding their first job in New York, to be able to stay, to find affordable housing citywide. So we're very, very optimistic that a 200,000 uh, unit goal, uh, uh, if resources are allocated and political will is expended, uh, is realizable and we will support that to the hill. And Joe Lotus said that he would like to build a Battery Park City on the east side of lower Manhattan. I mean, is that a, an appropriate project for that area in, in your estimation? Well, I'll, I'll just jump in, sure, Joe, please. Uh, uh, 
a lot of what I uh, read in that is about jobs. You know, uh, we have East Midtown, we have uh, uh, Hudson Yards. Uh, uh, Lower Manhattan, uh, since 9-11, has become the fulcrum for thinking about the future of the city. It's the visible face arriving to the city, transportation connections with the Fulton Street Transit Hub and with the PATH uh, terminal completed are better than ever. Uh, decent airport links, let's hope. Uh, so seeing the equivalent, both for residential and commercial purposes, of that balancing act. Right now, uh, uh, Lower Manhattan is uh, uh, very much weighted, uh, almost most lopsided uh, to the Hudson. Uh, the proposals in the Bloomberg administration and what Joe Loda is proposing, uh, we would support because it rebalances Lower Manhattan and makes it the magnet that it deserves to be. And Jill, how critical do you think uh, the realization of the tenets of your platform are to uh, the future economic vitality of the city? Oh, I think they're critical. I think they are really critical. I think the uh, you know, t people come from all over the world to come to New York and they come to our cultural institutions and they come to see our beautiful city and they come to walk on the High Line and see what's happening here and I think that is, uh, that is fundamental as well as improving the quality of life for everyday citizens uh, who, who live here and pr who work here. All of that makes us more, uh, more of a livable city. I think certainly in terms of making the educational initiatives and the applied science initiatives take hold, we have to have the micro units of housing, we have to have an environment that keeps people here once they get, excuse me, once they get here, that they come, they don't want to leave to go to cheaper cities where they can live, <laughs> live more easily and a nicer quality of life. We want to be able to keep them here in New York to help build our economy. And, and Rick, to what degree are, uh, is your platform uh, a response to the concerns of, of climate change post Sandy? Well, I'm glad you asked that question, Morgan, because uh, a, a big part of the platform and the part that we've actually gone a little bit further on uh, to elaborate more clear uh, principles of the post Sandy environment, um, um, people after uh, Sandy uh, felt a sense of vulnerability. Uh, about the physical environment, about their homes, their livelihood. Uh, we very much address that in the platform and talk in particular about housing issues, about critical buildings, about transportation infrastructure, uh, about the impact on uh, uh, zoning and regulatory changes. Uh, small changes that are proposed in our analysis, uh, um, uh, detail changes like where mechanical and electrical equipment are located in relation to zoning and allowable floor area, we go into great detail on, but the big picture issues for us were um, picked up uh, uh, by the uh, uh, mayor's uh, uh, special initiative report, uh, which is compendious. I think where we stand now in relation to the next administration is looking at how some of the analysis, uh, excellent thinking in the SIR report uh, can be effectuated when there may not be enough resources to do everything uh, with equal uh, um, speed and alacrity and, and prioritization. Uh, so what we hope to do with the next administration is to talk about some of our thinking as it related to the elaboration in the Bloomberg administration um, uh, that's long haul, that transcends administrations and that gives people who are new to New York and lifelong New Yorkers uh, uh, a sense that this city is here forever and we're not turning our back on the waterfront. In your proposal you talk about creating a new uh, deputy mayor position um, and c if you could just talk a little bit about uh, what that position would entail. Well I think uh, one of the uh, issues with moving projects through the system is that we get multiple reviews by different agencies, it really slows things down and there are many many steps to the process and from a design viewpoint you've got uh, certain agencies with certain jurisdictions and other uh, agencies with other jurisdictions like even the MTA below grade and city planning above grade and so really if there was uh, someone who was in charge of really looking at things comprehensively I think we could get better solutions more integrated solutions a more integrated process for um, looking at problems comprehensively these are not siloed issues the, the built environment really has to bring together a multitude of, of, of um, perspectives in order to come up with the right solutions that works for everyone and, and, what part and, and I would add that that's part of global competitiveness. I think that's something that we've seen other countries be able to do better than we can do, and other cities can do it better, where they can put together real estate development, subway systems, uh, infrastructure, uh, links to uh, uh, public open space and so forth in ways that that it's more difficult for us to do. So it's a global city, a world-class city, but it's also a city of neighborhoods. And as we think about the city and the state together, so too we think about how New York functions on the world stage, but also has to work at a neighborhood level. 
Um, what we think in terms of governmental reform is that there can be a position, call it a deputy mayor of design or urban design or planning and design, that has oversight to sort of link together the disparate needs of different neighborhoods, but also look at the big picture about how New York continues to thrive and, and survive on the global stage. And we've talked about some of the, the ways that the, the mayor can uh, uh, realize uh, some of the tenets of your platform. What, should the, what are your goals for the city council? City Council obviously has um, a lot to do with land use. Uh, I, I, I grew up when the Board of Estimate uh, had those powers and it has significantly changed uh, with the uh, uh, um, delegation of those land use and budgetary roles to the City Council. So our uh, interactions at committee level, uh, Council Member Weprin, for instance, uh, having a hearing two weeks ago on ADAPT and its relation to zoning, the micro unit competition, is that going to become city policy um, beyond a demonstration site on city-owned property, will those kinds of innovations that allow uh, young people to find less expensive and smaller apartments and also the aging to uh, be able to downsize and have an easier unit to maintain, that is a uh, mayoral initiative, if you will, but the council is determinative. So our interaction with particular council members, committees, and the council as a whole has largely been over policy as it relates to the key issues in our platform, starting with housing. Rick Bell, Jill Lerner, thank you so much for joining us. Thank, thank you, you very much. And that's it for this episode of Last Look. For more episodes, please join us on the web at cityandstateny.com.